Today we're going to go ahead and learn how to use the Core Digital Stethoscope to listen to heart sounds and to build your confidence using it as an assistive listening device with your hearing loss. And the content that I'm going to be covering today are five core topics to help you understand and hear the heart sounds with your stethoscope. And if you stay to the end of the video, I have a bonus topic to share with you, so stay tuned for that. Now, off camera, I work as a medical professional and I am a person with sensory neural hearing loss. And with that combo, I provide support to medical professionals with hearing loss. And we talk about challenges, education, strategies to improve our hearing abilities in our workplace as well as our personal lives. Welcome to Healthy Hearing Loss. My name is Dee Dee. And if you're new here, please support the channel by subscribing. I thank you for that. I will provide links and references to any topics or items that I cover in the description box below. Now, an important note is I'm not a cardiologist. So when we're talking about the heart sound, the experts are the cardiologist. I'm a generalist and I will go over the basics. I'm just going over stuff so that you can use your stethoscope the best you can to listen to the heart sound at a very basic form. And then you can add your knowledge as you practice. Now on to the topics. Number one topic is going to be anatomy and physiology of the heart in a nutshell. When I think about the heart, I think about it as a hollow space, like a ball. It's a hollow space and has four chambers inside. Now within these cavities are the blood. That's where the blood is housed inside these cavities. It either sits there or it moves to another cavity or it goes out to the lungs or it goes out to the entire body. Now when the heart contracts, it is pushing all the blood out of the heart into the rest of the body and that is called systole. That is the top number of your systolic blood pressure measurement. When the heart relaxes and it reduces that kind of pressure in there, then that would be your bottom number for your blood pressure measurement. Contract systole, relax diastole. In my last video, I talked about the blood pressure and taking it with the core stethoscope and you can see the picture here, but I'm going to keep the link in the description below because I want you to keep watching. And we know that we have the cavities within here that house the blood and it needs to move. But how do we get the blood to actually move? Well, the heart has to have a command center and that is where the conduction system comes in. And the SA node will just kind of spark it up and run around the heart and make the heart contract. And when it doesn't stimulate the heart, it's relaxed. And the heart and the lungs are very closely linked together, right? And so that's where the exchange happens, the gas exchange happens between the oxygen and the CO2. In order to get the blood inside here to move in sync, we have to have it moderated by some valves, right? So we have four valves. We have two valves that are actually inside of those cavities and they open and close together. So that is the mitral and tricuspid. They're buddies and they like to dance at the same time, opening and closing, allowing blood to move from one chamber to another. And then we have two other valves that are essentially outside of those chambers. And what they want to do is they dance together and move blood in and out of the heart or into the lungs or in and out of the lungs. And those are the aorta and pulmonary. Pulmonary. Topic number two, how to identify normal heart rate and sounds in an adult patient. And there are three ways that I want to talk about today. The first one is palpating. So we would want to palpate for a pulse and that's how we can feel the heart in its rhythm. And the most reliable and easy accessible one is your radio pulse. So we just place our fingers on the inner part of the lower wrist here and we just gently feel for a little bump, 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 bump. And what we want to do is obviously count the number of heartbeats that you're feeling in a minute. And the best way to do that, I think, is to count for 15 seconds and then multiply it by four. Or you can do it for 30 seconds and multiply by two, or you can do a full minute counting. I suggest doing the full minute if you feel like that rate is irregular. Now, a resting heart rate for an adult is anywhere between 60 and 100 beats per minute. And it does that to meet the body's oxygen needs. Anything below 60 and above is or could be abnormal. You want to consult your primary care provider if your resting heart rate is consistently below 60, which we consider bradycardia, or above 100, tachycardia. These are beats per minute 
minute, especially if you have symptoms such as dizziness, shortness of breath, or chest pain. And the second one out of the three I want to talk about is auscultation with a stethoscope. And if you have your stethoscope, you know you have a diaphragm and a bowel. And the one of those two are going to go on different places or various spots onto your heart. And underneath the diaphragm or the bowel is going to correspond to a valve that you're listening to that we've been talking about. We're going to go a little bit deeper on that later in the video. Let's get on to the last one, number three, and that is visualize an actual waveform that corresponds to the heart rate as well as sound. And that is going to be used with a digital software. As you know, the core digital stethoscope connects to the Echo app on your phone through Bluetooth. And how you actually hear this is going to depend on your setup. I'm using Bluetooth hearing aid, so I don't need anything more than this. I use my stethoscope, goes to my phone, my hearing aid connects, and I can hear everything just fine. I especially like this option because I can count the heart rate, I can hear the heart sounds, and I can see the waveforms all at the same time. Pretty neat. I like this option because I like to verify and prove to myself that what I see is what I'm hearing and they're in sync. So having all of that is really comforting, knowing that you're using Bluetooth technology because Bluetooth can be a little finicky, right? Can be finicky, finicky, finicky right? Topic number three, hot sounds. When you listen to hot sounds, you will hear this kind of bump, 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 boom, 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 whatever you want to term it. I'm going to use boom, boom, because I think it's easier to, I don't know. Does it go boom, boom? No. It goes bump, 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 but how do I spell that? So I'm going to use boom, boom. And a little animation here shows you boom, 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 boom. And that corresponds to what I know in the medical field is lub dub. Blub dub, blub dub, blub dub. And of course, what we really want to be using is S1 or S2. When we think about S1 and S2, one systolic, two diastolic. So we really want to make sure we map that out and we understand that because that's going to correspond to lub dub, boom, boom, whatever you want to use, S1, S2. Topic number four, we're going to be talking about hearing through our stethoscope as well as seeing on the waveforms. We're actually going to see some examples that I'll put up on the screen and actually listening to those sounds and really tune into what we hear to what we see so you really understand which one is S1 and S2. That's going to help you to find anything that's abnormal down the road. So practicing, we need to prepare. So let's prepare. I'm going to use my assistant Jade. Remember her from last week if you saw my video. This is Jade. How's it going, Jade? Welcome back. Hi, Nene. It's nice to be back. All right, Jade, so I'm going to be listening to your lung sounds today. I have my stethoscope. Before I get into this, I wanted to talk about my stethoscope. Remember, I have this just the way it is without the tubing. I'm going to go ahead and put the tubing on. I don't need the tubing, but I want to use it because it makes it a little bit easier for me to move the stethoscope around. I'll show you. So just know that I am not using the tubing. I do not put it in my ear. I just put it around my neck. The whole Hold it there and I can let it go. And I don't have to fumble with my pockets and all that kind of stuff. I don't have pockets up here today. Huh. Um, I don't want to be messing around with pockets. So I just leave it like this. We're going to be talking about the setting. We definitely want it to be a quiet and a warm setting because you're going to be exposing the patient's chest, right? Yeah, that's what you want to do. You want the patient to be sitting upright. Sometimes the patient may come up forward depending on where you're listening to heart sounds or they may be laying on their left lateral side. But for the purpose of this video, we're just going to allow Jade to sit up. She likes to sit up. She stays there. She's nice and put and she's happy just like that. Now, most of my patients in my clinical setting and where I work do not change into gowns. So this is perfectly appropriate. Some offices, you can have the patient change into a gown and that would be cool. But Jade's just going to stay with the shirt just like this. And we have the core digital stethoscope right here. With my stethoscope, I'm going to use the diaphragm for most of my sounds. There is one that I'm going to turn and use the bell, but I invite you to try both of them because you may find that you hear better with one or the other. So I would suggest playing around with which one you want to use. For myself, I've been using the diaphragm 
for most of my vowel sounds, my hat sounds. On the right side, on the second intercostal space, I'm going to listen for the aortic area, and I'm listening for the S1 and S2. I'll go to the other side, right at the same level, intercostal space, second intercostal space, to the pulmonic area. I'm remembering that the diaphragm picks up on higher frequencies. So I'm going to go a little bit lower and get to the tricuspid area. So we're going to go around the fifth intercostal space, right along the sternal border there, and I'm going to listen there. And from here, I'm going to go ahead and flip over to the bell. So I need to turn my stethoscope. I'm not going to expose Jade's chest because I don't think that would be appropriate on camera, but I am going to go down to the apex area. That's where the mitral valve is. And that one is a lower frequency sound. That's why I use the bell in that area. So there you go. This is a good one to say lean forward because it brings the heart closer to the chest wall. And you can hear a little bit better when you ask them move forward, but we'll just leave her sitting put. I don't want her to fall over. Now that we have all of our placement, we're looking at at listening for lub dub S1 F2, lub dub S1 S2, lub dub 1 2, lub dub 1 2, lub dub 1 2. If you keep doing that, you're never going to forget it. So do it. <laughs> but once you hear the sound, then you want to go ahead and open up the app, the Echo app on your phone. Place it down on the table in front of you. So once you get the hot sound and you hear Lub dub, that's one, that's two, one, two, one, two. That's when you want to go to your Echo app and open it up so that we can use that graphic waveform that represents S1 and S2. And you can see this, and I'm going to link it right here so you can see it. As I hear the sound, da, 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 da. Da, da. All right, so now a quick note about the Echo app itself. It has four locations that you can listen to. And when you record it, it's going to have a PCG on it. And that means photocardiogram. And the first placement they have on their app is the upper right sternal border, which is right here. And that is going to be aorta. Then you go directly onto the other side. So that is now going to be the upper left sternal border and that's where your pulmonic valve is. Then you go down, has here left lower sternal border, and that's gonna be where your tricuspid is. And then when you get down to the apex area, that's going to be your mitral valve. Just wanna make a quick note of that. Okay, that was really important. So making sure that you can hear it and see it on your Echo app at the same time will make it a lot easier for you to understand abnormal heart sounds once you get to that. And when it comes to the core stethoscope, go ahead and tell me in the comments below if there's anything specific that you want me to cover. Going on to topic number five, what affects the normal heart rate and heart sounds? When we think about the heart rate itself, we talk about exercise. Exercise, the body wants more oxygen, like the muscles really need oxygen. And to increase the demand, you have to have the lung and the heart dance a little bit faster, right? So they go a little bit faster to get more oxygen into the body. So that is going to increase your heart rate. We have some medications like asthma medications, like those are the inhalers, the beta-2 agonists that increase your heart rate. We have also have over-the-counter medication like cold medication, decongestants can increase your heart rate. We have nicotine that, you know, stimulates and releases epinephrine, so that increases your heart rate. And of course, illicit drugs such as cocaine and amphetamines can also increase the heart rate. We also have stress hormones can also increase the heart rate. You know that autonomic system, specifically sympathetic nervous system, that's the fight or flight. You know, you just like either have a perceived danger or an actual danger and your heart rate will go up and you just, ah, that increases your heart rate. So if you're stressed out, you know, in that last video, I had a five minute meditation. I'll link it at the end of this video if you want to do a five-minute meditation to lower your heart rate as well as your blood pressure. Super good. When it comes to the heart sounds, it could be a congenital defect or it can be a structural abnormality. Inspiration, expiration can also increase or change your heart sounds and your weight as well. Medical conditions such as endocarditis, Marfan syndrome, or pulmonary hypertension, those sort of things. At this point, we're going to come to the bonus. If you're liking this kind of topic, go ahead and hit the like button, subscribe, and also the bell notification so you know about my next video coming up. Abnormal heart sounds in an adult. I don't cover children because they're very hard and difficult to hear sounds in, and I just cover adults. Let me take this thing off. It's starting to whip it around. I use it as a...
<laughs> now we know that the valves that we've been talking about, the guys that dance together and open and close, they could either become obstructed in some way or uh, weakened and not closed all the way. So we're talking about stenosis as well as regurgitation. That's when the valve doesn't shut all the way and it regurgitates back and stenosis is a narrowing. So it is important that we understand normal and abnormal, but the only way you're going to know abnormal is to know what normal is, right? So if you know what S1 and S2 sounds like, then you're good to go to finding out what is abnormal. And to hear abnormal sounds is going to be either between S1 and S2, outside of S1 and S2. It could be a snapping sound. It could be a roaring sound. It could be a musical sound. It could be all kinds of sounds. Right, Jade? Yeah, she's getting bored with me. I hope you're not. So we're going to be doing the descriptors, and the descriptors are going to be listed here. You can see them and look at those yourself, but basically you want to understand what the descriptors are because that's how you're going to document it. When I was in grad school, they taught us how to do this and wanted us to go back and tell them what type of murmur actually was, right? Was it a mitral regurgitation or stenosis or was it an aortic regurgitation or stenosis, that type of thing. So it was put in our mind that we basically could diagnose those murmurs. You can't. You cannot diagnose murmurs. You can only say what the descriptors are in your documentation. So when you're listening, you need to make sure that you do the descriptors first. The intensity, we want to look at the frequency, which is the pitch. You want to look at the quality, the duration, the configuration, location, radiation, all that kind of stuff. But when you're listening to sounds, there's so much to it. You're listening, to, oh, that's an abnormal sound. Is it loud? Is it soft? Is it, mm? you know, and is it, where is it happening? Is it happening before S1 or after S1? And then you have to listen to a certain location because that's going to kind of give you a general area where that murmur might be, and if it radiates up into the neck or to the axilla, that type of thing. It takes a lot of practice to listen to murmurs themselves, but what you're doing is you're gathering information to document. The only way to diagnose a murmur is to have an echocardiogram, and if you have an abnormal, very loud, concerning murmur, whether it's a systolic or a diastolic murmur, you have to send them off to the experts, the cardiologist, to to determine what needs to be done. Do they need repair? Is it benign? That type of thing. I'm not getting into that in this video. Like I said, we're talking about the basics here. First thing is to be able to hear the S1, S2, find out what's normal, and then go to what is abnormal and learning how to do the descriptors, listening really carefully and be able to document them well. If you want to learn more about murmurs, I'm actually going to put a couple of videos I, that I've been watching on YouTube that I've really respected educators and teachers on the heart sounds. I thought they were fabulous. And then watching those two videos, go ahead and check out my playlist for medical providers with hearing loss to see if there's anything else you want to learn about any of the stethoscopes that we can use. Thanks for sticking around at the end. I will see you next time. Take care. Bye. She's funny. Peace. Once you find a comfortable seat, allow yourself to root down into your seat with your sit bones. Elongate your spine. We'll go ahead and relax your hands down onto your thighs. With your eyes closed or softly gazing. Allow your eyelids to be very heavy. And start to bring your awareness to your breath. Feeling the rise and fall of your chest. No need to change or manipulate it at this time. We're just noticing. I'm going to do a scan of the body first. Go ahead and check out your face. Loosen any areas that are tight that you're holding on to between your eyebrows, around your eyes, down to your cheeks, and release your jaw. Soften your throat and release any tension in your neck. Soften the shoulders and allow your arms, elbows, hands, and fingers 
to be completely relaxed. Let your chest be light and your belly be warm. Release any tension in the legs, feet and toes. Bring your awareness to the space between your shoulder blades. And release any tension there. And then soften your entire back. Feel a sense of heaviness as you settle into your seat. In the present moment, if you find that your mind is wandering to your to-do list, or thoughts about what happened yesterday, what you need to do tomorrow, just know that the only moment that exists is the present moment now with the current breath. You can't get back a past breath and you cannot take a future breath sooner than it comes. You can only breathe right at the moment. So continue to breathe nice and easy. Scanning the body again. And then I want you to imagine some clouds going above your head from one side to the other, just kind of floating by. This is an opportunity to allow the thoughts in your mind to just go into a cloud and drift away. If you can mentally do this, you would be amazed by its effect. Throw as many thoughts as you want into the cloud. Maybe they're going by fast because you have so many. But the more you let go of those thoughts into those fast, rapid clouds, you'll start to notice that they start to slow down as the thoughts start to diminish. That fight you had with somebody, throw it in the cloud. The mean patient, throw it in the cloud something you said that you didn't like, throw it in the cloud. Worrying about a presentation you're gonna give, throw it in the cloud. So allowing those thoughts to just go by. You find yourself even more at peace, relaxed. Your body is completely heavy. Just a couple more breaths as you get rid of any other thoughts into those clouds. And then bring your awareness back to your body. Just noticing. Nothing is wrong in meditation. But one of the hardest things to do is actually just sit and to do it. Can you feel your heartbeat? Can you feel that it's slow? If it's nice and slow, then your blood pressure is probably pretty good at this point. Start to deepen your breath, taking an inhale through the nose, and exhale out through the nose or the mouth. Take another deep inhale, holding at the top, and exhale, letting go of everything. Start to wiggle the toes and wiggle your fingers, and then slowly open your eyes.